good Sunday morning from the chapel on the hill. We are glad that you have joined us for this time together. We have a special announcement to share with you today. If everything goes as planned, we will resume in-person services at 10 a.m. next Sunday here in the chapel. But all of us must observe COVID-19 protocols, wearing masks, social distancing, and so on. Watch for special instructions to be sent out this coming week. We now invite you to respond to the goodness of this spring Sunday that we have been given as we join together in a time of celebration, reflection, and worship. Let us pray. God of all, for the beauty of this day and this spring season, for the trees robed in blossoms and the flowers in bloom, for the presence and power of love in our lives, for this day and the joys that are ours for being a part of this community of faith. For all of these blessings and more, we lift our voices in prayer and gratitude this day. In your name we pray, amen. And now Suzanne has a special message to share with our children. Good morning. I still miss you. And you know what? Missing you makes me grumpy. But next week, I get to see you in person. And I am really looking forward to that. Okay. I want to tell you a story this morning. And it's a story with the cast of Sebra. You, your sibling, or maybe you look more like this, your best friend, a soccer player, a Nintendo Switch, an ice cream truck, and the sun. Okay, here's how it goes. Your sibling had been saving money forever to buy a Nintendo Switch. And your sibling is nice enough to let you play with it. But you have to ask first. And you have to ask every time. That's fair enough. Okay. Your best friend has been wanting to play with a Nintendo Switch forever. So they ask you, please, 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 can I play with your sibling's Nintendo Switch? Well, unfortunately, your sibling's not home. But you think, uh, maybe it's okay. I'll just go borrow it anyway. So you go in their room, gives you kind of a funny feeling, and you take the Nintendo Switch, and, gotta find my cast of mini here, you and your best friend go to the park to play with the Nintendo Switch, and you're having a good time. It is a beautiful, sunny day. And then, while you're playing, you hear the ice cream truck coming down the road. Now, if this was a story when I was a kid, we would hear an ice cream truck. So, quick as a wink, you and your friend get up and run to get an ice cream. And you're eating your ice cream, and you're laughing, and you're having a good time, and then you notice your friend's not holding the Nintendo Switch. And you also notice that out on the field of the park where you were, there are now a bunch of kids playing soccer. And you ask your friend, where's the Nintendo Switch? And your friend says, I left it on the grass. So you run back and you find the Nintendo Switch, but it's been stepped on by 
by the soccer player and now it has a broken screen and you get a horrible stinking feeling and your friend's eyes get huge and they run home. Okay, you got a big problem. You have a broken Nintendo Switch and now you are holding a great big ball of guilt. It's like holding a red hot coal and all you want to do is get rid of it. So what are you going to do with it? Well, you start thinking, okay, what can I do? Okay, okay, first of all, we can blame the soccer player. Let's give him the guilt. I mean, he stepped on it, right? Yeah, that didn't quite work. No way he could have known it was in the grass. And then you think, okay, who can I blame? Uh, let's see, let's blame my sibling. I mean, they should have been home, right? If they'd been home, I would have asked. No, that doesn't work either. Okay, who can we blame? Who can we blame? <gasps> Let's blame the ice cream truck. I mean, if the ice cream truck hadn't come down the road, you and your friend wouldn't jumped up and left the Nintendo Switch in the grass, right? No, that's not gonna work either. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Let's blame the sun. It's a beautiful day. If it hadn't been a beautiful day, we wouldn't have gone to the park. The soccer player wouldn't have come to the park. The ice cream truck wouldn't have come to the park. Well, even you know it's kind of silly to blame the sun. Okay, we're running out of options here. Uh, now you got it. Let's blame your best friend. Yeah, they're the ones who left it in the grass. They're the ones who made you borrow it. Let's blame them. Let's just pass that guilt off to your friend, okay? That's the problem with guilt. Even when you blame other people, you can't get rid of it. It's still going to be burning up inside of you. So what are you going to do? How are you going to get rid of that hot guilt? Well, you got to own up to what you did. you got to tell the truth. And yeah, your sibling's probably going to be a little bit mad at you. Your mom and your dad are probably going to be a little bit upset with you. And you're going to have to do something to make it right. But you're going to find that by telling the truth and doing the right thing, you can let go of that guilt. And you can feel good about yourself. You did the right thing. Thank you for joining me. I hope you have a great week. And I really hope I see you next week.
Our first reading is from the book of Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses. Aaron is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all of their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may come into the camp. And our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I again invite you to join me in a time of prayer and reflection. God, Spirit of life, we look forward to this time together for a variety of reasons. Many of us cherish this time because of the connection we share with those of like mind and loving spirit. Many of us cherish this time because we long to see the bigger picture of life as we are reminded that we are a part of a much greater whole, that we are interconnected with this great, vast, mysterious web of life. Some of us cherish this time because we are searching, searching for answers to some of life's riddles searching for greater understanding of what it means to be authentically human and to be spiritual beings, searching for meaning in life, searching for hope in a life or existence beyond this life. And some of us cherish this time because we feel it is important to be a part of a progressive community of faith that speaks to the problems, concerns, and issues of the world and seeks ways to make a positive difference. So whatever the reasons that lead us to share this time together, we become unified in our common convictions, worship, sense of connectedness, and our search. And we also join in spirit with those whose journey is difficult this day, those who are ill, in the hospital, weak, enduring rigorous treatments or therapy, troubled, grieving, or uncertain about the future. As we pool our positive thoughts, heartfelt prayers, well wishes, and the words of encouragement, may each one find greater strength, grace, and comfort for the day and the day for this day and the days ahead. Together we offer these spoken prayers and now the silent reflections of our hearts. Amen. Something I read recently set me to thinking about the ancient idea of scapegoating. Now, you may be thinking that's an odd, antiquated, topic for you to be thinking about, but bear with me. 
So this past week, I did a bit of research on the topic. First, I went back to the Hebrew scriptures and I was surprised to learn that the term scapegoat occurs only three times in the entire Bible. All three of them are found in Leviticus chapter 16 that was read earlier. According to this passage, the scapegoat was connected with what would become, or what would come to be known as Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. As Leviticus described it, two innocent goats would be chosen by the Jewish priest and one would be sacrificed and the other would have the sins and guilt of the people symbolically transferred to it. And then it would be driven off into the wilderness. Such was to occur on an annual basis. And the text says he, that is Aaron, the high priest, is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness. So each year, the Jewish people could enjoy a, quote, fresh start, as it were, as they engaged in prayers and Rituals and actions that gave a sense of relief and assurance that sins and guilt had been forgiven. Hence, the scapegoat, as I understand it at least, was part of a larger religious drama that had positive spiritual, emotional, psychological, and societal benefits. But somewhere along the way, the idea and practice of scapegoating went awry. Not with the Jewish people and their religious practices, but with humanity as a whole. At various times throughout history, various ethnic groups or certain segments of society, all like the ancient goat, totally innocent, have become a scapegoat and have had unwarranted guilt and blame transferred to them, thus making them a target for hatred, scorn, and violence. During difficult times in history, many people feel the need to place blame somewhere for what ails society. Targeting a person or group of people is a lame attempt at trying to explain why bad things happen. Scapegoating is a misguided attempt to relieve anxiety. It can be a flawed exercise in trying to make ourselves feel better. Ironically, the Jewish people themselves, time and again, have become a primary scapegoat and target for misplaced blame and hatred. The Jews have been blamed for such things as causing the Black Death, the plague that killed thousands of people throughout Europe during the Middle Ages. Hence, society's scapegoat. In reality, the Black Death likely was caused by rats and fleas. In Austria, in the early 20th century, the Jews were blamed for bad economic times. This had a profound impact upon the thinking of Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust that would follow. And the Jews have been blamed for the economic woes of the world at other times as well. A scapegoat for society. At different times, the LGBTQ community has been the scapegoat and focus of blame for 
such things as natural disasters. When massive hurricanes have struck, conservative televangelists have attributed the cause of those hurricanes to the sinful lifestyle, as they put it, of gays and lesbians. Hence, society's scapegoat. Most recently, and this is what really set me to thinking about the practice of scapegoating, Asian Americans have become a scapegoat, being blamed for the coronavirus. We have heard numerous reports of Asian Americans being brutally attacked, including one elderly Asian American woman walking to church on a city street sidewalk while shopkeepers a few feet away stood by and watched without intervening. Many more examples could be cited, but you get the idea. When bad things happen, a human tendency is to try to pinpoint the cause, to find someone to blame, to single out a, a societal scapegoat upon which to transfer anger, anxiety, and aggression. As President Dwight D. Eisenhower put it, the search for a scapegoat is the easiest of all hunting expeditions. So when it comes to scapegoating, what can, what should progressive-minded Christians do? Be cognizant. Cognizant of the fact that scapegoating takes place yet today. Whenever world problems press upon us, people become anxious and fearful and feel the need to pinpoint the cause of those problems. Be observant. Identify instances of scapegoating when certain groups are singled out for blame and become the scapegoat for misplaced hatred and acts of violence. Be compassionate. Reach out to members of groups who are singled out for misplaced anger and aggression and let them know that you care. Be vocal. Speak out and stand up for those who are victims of misplaced hatred and violence. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Rationalizations and the incessant search for scapegoats are the psychological cataracts that blind us to our sins. In case you haven't noticed these past few years, society is full of sins. And scapegoating is just one of them. In ancient Hebrew religion, the idea of the scapegoat driven off into the wilderness, symbolic, symbolically taking with it the sins and guilt of the people, served psychological, spiritual, and societal purposes. But the practice of scapegoating a group of people or segment of society by thrusting upon them unwarranted blame for the world's problems, resulting in hatred and violence, is evil, pure and simple. And when it comes to something like modern day scapegoating, it falls to people like us to be standard bearers of reasonable, rational thought, responsible action, mercy, compassion, and understanding. May it be so. Amen. 
And now may God grant us wisdom and may God grant us courage for the living of these days. May we have the strength to stand up for the right and speak out against that which is wrong. And may the grace of God be with us all.